Welcome back to yet another episode of EMI. This is the EMI for the month of December. Let's jump right in. In this month's EMI, we take a quick look at four key questions that were and continue to remain on the minds of the markets. Firstly, we look at what really explains the weakness seen in Q2 GDP numbers? What do wholesale prices tell you about corporate margins? Which sectors have driven center and state capex announcements in the first half of this financial year? And lastly, how does the first half private capex announcement data, how does it look like? These are the four key questions we are looking to address in this month's EMI. Let's start straight away with the first question, the GDP numbers. We all know that uh, the GDP numbers that came in, the GDA came in at around 5.6, the GDP came in marginally lower. It came in way below what the markets were expecting. Markets were expecting somewhere close to around a 6.5% GDP number. It came in much lower at around 5.4 or so. The GBA came in at 5.6. Now, apart from a marginal drop in a broad momentum that you can see, what uh, can be attributed to this sharp drop, much sharper than market expectations? What really went on there? Two key pointers there. Why did manufacturing fall? Now, before we come to that question, take a look at this chart here. This breaks down your GDP number by the segment, by the segment of manufacturing, by the segment of services, etc. You can see here that the orangish uh, shares are largely the services shares. The blue lines and the blue colors of the bars are related to industry, mining and quarrying, construction, uh, electricity, etc. So the dark blue line here, you can the dark blue uh, bars here, you can see them witnessing a fair bit of a contraction. And in the second quarter, you see they are seeing the dark blue bar contract quite sharply. Now, this is telling you that the contribution of manufacturing to the GDP numbers, to the GDA numbers, has seen a sharp contraction. Manufacturing contribution to uh, GDP numbers dropped by roughly around 80 basis points or so. It fell 80 basis points and its contribution to GDA was 0.4%. So why did manufacturing fall? Two key reasons. You saw a drop in corporate operating profit which is the earning season number that you saw, and lower government capex. These were the two main reasons why you saw a drop in manufacturing, a sharper drop than expected in manufacturing. Now, let's look at why manufacturing is important and what pushes manufacturing. The chart on the right here, the chart below, tells you why capex is really important. If you see a drop in capex, you eventually also see a drop in manufacturing growth. Capex growth and manufacturing growth are fairly linked. You saw the center's capex. So the last EMI, we talked about how state and center capex were seeing a drop. The chart here, you can see the same uh, line here. The dark blue line talks about the earning season operating profit for BSE 500 companies, non-financials. You can see that seeing a drop there. Along with that, you're also seeing center's capex growth coming off. So this is telling you that when center cuts back its capex numbers, then growth in center's capex comes off. You see that reflecting in the listed universe, non-financial listed corporate uh, universe, or in the operating profit numbers. Now, when I link that, we saw capex growth drop leads to manufacturing growth drop. What also you see is if you see manufacturing growth plotted here against the operating profit for BSE 500 non-financial companies, you can see that they also move fairly in line. Now, why is this important? When you look at GDP numbers, GDP numbers is not just an indication of volume growth. It is a reflection of volume plus value add. So if you look at the IIP numbers, the IIP numbers in the September quarter did see uh, a drop, but it was not a very sharp drop, which was sort of telling us that the larger than expected fall has been mostly because of the drop in the value add that's get, that gets captured in the GDP numbers through your operating profit drop. And it is this drop in the operating profit that we saw in the earnings numbers in the September earnings season that has led to this larger than expected drop in GDP numbers. So in the December quarter, if you see uh, an appreciable pickup in government capex, you could see some uh, positive impact there on the earnings narrative for these BSE 500 listed non-financial companies, the operating profit segment, that could sort of uh, see to it that your GDP numbers or at least momentum has probably bottomed out in the September quarter. We'll have to wait and see. Probably the December numbers will come in by end of February. The second question we are looking at is related to the earnings season of gross margins. Now, what are gross margins? 
gross margins is your revenue minus cost of goods sold. So you're not looking at the admin component. You're just taking the cost of goods sold, raw material loosely. You take that from your uh, uh, revenue numbers and you get the um, uh, gross, and you take that as a percentage of your revenue, it become, you get your gross margin numbers. So your gross prof profit divided by your revenue as a percentage is your gross margin. Now gross margins are very important for all companies. What does the direction of gross margins, what uh, does it link with? If you look at the chart on the left here, what we've done is we've broken down the WPI numbers, the wholesale price index numbers, you've broken it down into input components and output components, and you're looking at a growth rate there. Whenever you see a gap between input components and output components, the growth there, you always know that there is some gross margin expansion that is taking place. For example, you, you see this phase here, you can see growth in input has started coming off quite sharply, it goes into the negative, and this has been that strong phase nearly around a year or so, where you saw continuous gross margin expansion in the earnings narrative for the corporate universe. If you plot the same chart in a different way on the right hand side, instead of looking at growth, if you just look at the index number of input cost, the input cost, if I index that and I plot that against uh, uh, gross margins of uh, BSC 200 companies, here, the way you read this chart is if you see the light blue line, which is the gross margin of BSC 200 companies, if you see the light blue line moving up, it means your gross margins are contracting. So you have to understand this is on the inverse scale here. So rising input costs uh, uh, mean uh, a contraction in gross margins. And when you see uh, input costs coming off, it is telling you that your gross margins are expanding. And this was a very key phase that we saw around September of 2022 to September of 2023. Uh, gross margin expansion was as high as around 670 basis points. And this was a, a key period for corporate earnings where you saw continuous cross margin expansion for nearly four quarters back to that. Was this uh, a scene in the input numbers? You could have seen this in the input numbers as well. You saw June 2022 to June 2023 was the space where you saw input price index see witness a drop. And it has been in line with that, that your gross margins have actually seen an expansion. The, chart, the table over here gives you a good sense as to how sectorally gross margins have moved from pre-COVID to now. So if I take a five-year delta from September 2019 to September 2024, you can see that your uh, uh, gross margin, apart from probably healthcare as a segment, you've actually seen gross margins sort of contract and gross margins today are below where they were for uh, compared, when compared to September 2019. In between, there, were a, there was a brief period for certain segments where gross margins were above uh, their pre-COVID levels, but as they stand today, they are below where they were in pre-COVID levels. And the last column here tells you for the same sectors, in this September quarter from the June quarter, quarter and quarter, what has actually been the change in gross margins. The five-year move gives you a very broad picture of uh, how gross margins have sort of moved over for different sectors, for the BSE 200 companies, non-financial. BSC 200 companies. So uh, key takeaway from this slide is you have to closely track the WPI index, especially the input items on the WPI index. The October numbers gave you a small indication that from September, the month of September, the October month saw a marginal inch up in input prices. If that continues, then it could mean that the directionality of gross margins probably might not change. Now we come to center and state CAPEX announcements, rather investment project announcements. How have they, uh, the center and state fared in the first half of the financial year, this FY25? We are looking at top six sectors for the center and roughly around the top 10 sectors for the states. As you can see in this chart here, uh, central government CAPEX announcements on a year on year basis, H1 this year compared to H1 of last year, it fell 21%. But if you look at the top six sectors, what were the top six sectors in the first half where you saw a lot of announcements on CAPEX were largely um, hydro and renewable announcements, followed by highways, port, and a bit of railways. If we move to state CAPEX announcements, state CAPEX announcements saw a pickup of around 23%, largely on the back of your road transport projects, uh, water supply, and sanitation projects. What you also saw was a sharp drop for the states in the segments of irrigation, housing, renewables, and railways. Announcements in these segments saw a fair bit of a drop in the first half of FY25. 
Now we come to the last part um, of the macro segment of EMI. We are looking at, we look at the center and state CAPEX announcements. We look at the private CAPEX announcements this time around. The last EMI, uh, do remember that uh, we dealt with private CAPEX and government CAPEX. We were talking about how until FY23, you still saw a fair bit of a pickup in private CAPEX, though the narrative was not uh, as strong around private CAPEX. We also saw how the unlisted private CAPEX universe appeared to have seen a fair bit of a pickup all the way from FY12. And in 23, unlisted appears to have seen a drop and listed CAPEX has seen uh, a marginal inch up there. In this slide here, we talk about just the um, private CAPEX announcements for the first half of this fiscal year. As you can see visibly in this chart, the first half, your private CAPEX uh, appears to have come off a fair bit, of around 34% drop in the year-on-year -year numbers. But one positive, if you look at a breakup of uh, private and government CAPEX in the first half of this year, roughly still around 70% of your announcements continue to remain private in nature. So there does seem to be some momentum holding up. If you then break up private CAPEX announcements by segments, what are the segments that have actually seen a pickup? You can see renewable energy, housing, chemicals, auto and uh, uh, components. These have been the segments that have seen a fair bit of a pickup in announcements in the first half of this year. Now, these are announcements. Now, how do you map announcements and implementation? That is an interesting chart that we brought around in this uh, slide. You can see that the directionality between announcements and implementation seem to be fairly there with a two quarter lag. So which does mean, which means, how do you read this chart? This chart tells you that if around the dark blue line, you can see implementation coming down. You can see announcements two quarters before the announcements start coming down. So we've lagged the dark blue line by uh, two quarters, which is six months, which means if you see the blue line come down now, two quarters later, you would see the dark blue line coming down. So if you go by that, your implementation, your uh, announcements have seen a pickup in the last few quarters, which means that your implementation is likely to pick up uh, in the next couple of quarters. This relationship between this lag, the relationship between investment projects announced and investment projects implemented appears to be directionally there with key uh, inflection points also working all the way from FY 2009. We now move to the macro part. Four short uh, charts on macro. One is on GDP numbers. Uh, we dealt with this in detail in the first slide. But nevertheless, one positive here is though your GDP numbers have been coming off, if you look at private consumption spending growth, that has held up a fair bit and has not really turned around, telling us that there is a fair bit of resilience, like the RBI has been uh, indicating, there's been a fair bit of resilience in your GDP numbers, even in the Q2 uh, quarter. This chart talks about the key um, movers of inflation from uh, the start of this financial year. You can see very clearly here that vegetable prices and prices of oils and fats, these have been the two largest contributors of the increase in your uh, headline inflation. It has added nearly 2% to your headline inflation, just vegetables and uh, oil and oils, in fact, these two categories. Third chart is around electronic goods uh, exports. I'm sorry, this should have been exports. Uh, you've seen a fair bit of an increase here in your electronic goods exports, largely thanks to the PLI uh, momentum and broadly also support of global growth. And the last and the most important, if I look at net imports of electronics, over the last four years, even if I look at it from FY19, you haven't really seen any significant increase. They have been fairly range bound, which is actually a positive for uh, uh, the PLI as a narrative as well. Now we come to the last segment. What must you know before investing? Two key charts here. This is a reiteration of what we uh, brought about in our first EMI. In our first EMI, we spoke about lump sum investing and we talked about what is the minimum time frame one must invest in the markets if you are a lump sum investor. In this uh, uh, month's presentation, we take a look at what is the minimum time frame that an SIP investor must look at. So what is the probability of negative returns if you are an SIP investor? The way you read this is this: these are your probability of negative return and this is your uh, time frames. So this is telling you that Nearly 8% nearly of the time, if you are an SIP investor for just one year, nearly 8% of the time, you probably lose your capital. If you are a three-year SIP investor, there is still a possibility of losing capital, roughly around the 2.2.3% probability. But if you're a seven-year investor, seven-year and beyond, any SIP investment of seven-year and beyond, 
historically is telling you that you have an SIP investor has never lost his money. But you invest in the markets not to uh, save your capital. You need a certain decent amount of return. And what is that decent amount of return? I think it would be fair to say in the large cap space, more than 12% CAGR of your XIRR for your SIP return, I think is a very real reasonable number to look at. What are your time frames? Seven year, 11 year, and 14 year. These are the three time frames that come across for an SIP investor purely from a probability point of view. Now, why seven, 11, and 10? There's a 70% probability that as an SIP investor, if you have been invested for a minimum seven year period, you have a 70% probability of making 12% CAGR, a 74% probability if you are a 12 year uh, uh, investor in SIP of making 12% CAGR, and 83. If you increase your time frame to 14 years, there is an 83% probability that you have made more than 12% CAGR in large cap if you're an SIP investor. The longer you go, so uh, the, the minute you cross 16, 17 years, your probability gets closer and closer to 90 and then it becomes 100%. Closer to your 20 year time frame, it becomes 100% probability of making more than 12% CAGR. So these two slides tell you why for an SIP investor, just like a lump sum investor, the time frame of investing is extremely important. This tells you that you must, if you are an SIP investor, you must not look at any time frame that is less than seven years, because like we keep saying, there are only two types of investors, lucky investors and unlucky investors. If you think you're an unlucky investor and you in invest in the market, your downside, you're trying to limit your downside to as much as possible. So there are no negative surprises. You only will be seeing positive surprises. And when you interpret data based on that, SIP investors, minimum time frame must be seven years. And if you want to increase that probability of 12% CAGR, 11 year plus time frame gives you a higher and higher probability of making 12% CAGR as an SIP investor in the equity markets in the large cap space. We'll leave you with this last slide. Um, a very, very important quote by uh, the economist Paul Samuelson. He talks about how investing should be more like watching paint dry or watching grass grow. He also, if the uh, entire quote, talks about how if you want excitement, you should probably uh, uh, go to the casinos. But if you uh, want to really build your wealth, it should be patience. It should be a longer time frame. It is that that really builds your uh, wealth, builds your portfolio. This is, uh, this is Arjun signing off. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully.